Why is one of the most successful creators leaving YouTube? I'm taking a break from YouTube. I need to step back completely and give myself weeks, months, years if I need to. By the end of the episode, we're actually gonna pitch Emma on a way that we think she could return to YouTube in a healthy way. We're also going to suggest a change that we think YouTube should make to the platform. So if you don't know who Emma Chamberlain is, we've spoken about her a lot on this show. She's basically, in our eyes, like Seinfeld reimagined for YouTube. What's the show about? It's about nothing. <laughs> Seinfeld was a show about nothing. Emma Chamberlain is essentially a show about nothing, but she's so entertaining. I'm not gonna shower, although I'm quite dirty. Not in the mood to work out, so I'm not gonna do that. You guys know what that means. The unbelievable thing about it is that she posted for 55 straight months, averaged four videos a month during that time span of 2017 to 2021. To be clear, that's like one video a week. And her videos averaged five million views per video during that run. That's incredible. She went for four years. And today, Emma is 20 years old. The channel has over 11 million subscribers and it's generated over 1.5 billion views. So she's like one of the most successful creators on the platform. But as we've learned in her podcast, she struggled a lot internally. I've probably hit burnout 40 times. Every time I've hit burnout, it's gotten a little bit worse. And we've seen it happen. She's sort of disappeared from the platform multiple times. This time around, as far as we know from her podcast, this is more of an indefinite break. Burnout is something that is incredibly common with creators. And the just the nature of YouTube actually lends itself to that. I was on this hamster wheel of creating weekly videos. Not a week has gone by where I have not thought about YouTube. When something is that all-consuming, Burnout is completely inevitable. We've experienced this as well. We're on a weekly posting schedule and we call this the cycle. The cycle is the endless nature of a YouTube upload schedule. The fact that the second that you put out one video, you're already working on the next video. And that does not allow you the time to have a macro perspective of what you're doing. You're just week to week. I felt this pressure to know what move to take next, but yet I didn't even understand how I succeeded in it in the first place. I didn't have the time to sort through this dilemma because as I've mentioned earlier, I'm supposed to be uploading every week or else, girl, it's not even gonna matter what direction I take. And not only that, the platform is also, like YouTube Studio is telling you to post more. When you flatline a bit, you don't post for two weeks, all of your arrows go from green to gray. And it's literally said, there's like a line of text in the YouTube studio that tells you what's going on. And it's like, you've posted fewer videos this month, which is causing a decrease in viewership. And you're like, damn it, I have to post more videos. You're right, YouTube studio. And the way we define burnout is creative output without direction. So you're essentially just having all of this creative output week to week without having a sense of where's this all going? Why am I, why am I doing this? And that's what leads to burnout. I started to think about the concept of YouTube in general. This led me down an even darker existential crisis where I'm like, what even is this? Like, what even is this? The concept of me just filming myself and then posting it, that's it? And that's my job? I was like, what the f What the f This is so weird. She talks about like, trying to make YouTube work in a more sustainable and healthy way. Like, how do you keep up that regular posting cadence without burning out. And I think that's a problem that a lot of creators face and hiring an editor is typically your first thought. But she mentions that that was essentially like losing her role in the channel. And I could just hand my footage off to my editor and turn a blind eye to it after that and just press upload and not give a fuck. I could do that. But that's not me. That's not passionate. That's not honest. Editing is the storytelling, you know, editing is the artistic part of it for me. A lot of the issue comes when as a creator, you may love a video that you make. You may consider it a one out of 10. And then you post it and YouTube in the back end will literally give you a number rating and it can easily many times be a 10 out of 10. And it starts to change how you feel about what you're making. And for Emma, she's making videos about herself. So that's like, you know, the algorithm, which is essentially just representative of the audience deeming her a 10 out of 10. That's right. extremely difficult to deal with on a week to week basis. And to be clear, in the YouTube studio, a one out of 10 is the best you can do. Literally confetti comes out of it. 
Have you seen that? Literal like, confetti. It just goes, and it's like, amazing. You That's did the best. Exciting. It's a one out of 10. Your yeah. click-through rate's crazy. And it's like, oh, I want that again. Give me that dopamine. Then when you have a 10 out of 10, all the numbers are gray. Yeah. And so is your life. Yeah. And YouTube's like, your viewers are no longer interested in you. <laughs> yeah. 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 They just don't. I don't yeah. know what to tell you, man, but you didn't, you didn't do it this time. You're just a worse version of yourself. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and you may never get it back. And it's not just the platform. This is something that's just you as a product, as someone who's engaging a community. This is something that occurs off YouTube as well. Like if you imagine yourself as a bakery, right? That's open every day. You have to keep baking pastries and bread for people to actually be able to engage with it. Imagine if running a bakery and just being like, I'm taking a break, so, but the doors are still open. So people are walking in and being like, where's the stuff? So as a, as a channel, you're always on as a YouTube channel. So your community is coming back being like, where is, where is the product? I'm going to stay on the bakery thing. Okay, please. Because now I'm also a little hungry. Yeah. Being Emma Chamberlain and being a creator is basically like owning the bakery, okay. working at the bakery, mm -hmm. and being the bread. <laughs> and so if someone doesn't like the bread, it hurts on every level. Oh, that's good. Yeah. As opposed to maybe a more traditional job. Where you're not the bread. You're not the bread. Right. <laughs> you're maybe someone who just works for the baker. And if someone doesn't like the bread, yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's not your bakery. Mm -hmm. Are you still buying Wonder Bread? No. I have, I've been in LA for 10 years. I have upgraded my bread. Incorrect. I'm I've been at, no, I've been oh, at your no, new house no. with Wonder Bread there. Dave's Killer Bread. Yeah, Dave's Killer Bread's great, but I've been at yeah. your house with a bag of Wonder Bread You don't bread think there. I've learned yeah. at this point? <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying. I've I mean, been I there. do like white bread with yeah. peanut butter and jelly, Jif with Smuckers. I know, I know you so good. You're right. It's so good. It's dynamite. Yeah, it's just yeah. dynamite. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. <laughs> it's like a, like a lollipop on a sandwich. It's like a lollipop <laughs> in a sandwich. <laughs> um, so all of this is a lot of the reason why it's so hard to sustain a long-term career on YouTube. It's so hard to stay in this cycle for such a long period of time. Yeah. And we wrote about this in the published press as well. And you know, the problem is for a creator like Emma, her YouTube videos and the community that she has off, off of those YouTube videos is the basis for every facet of her business. It is how I have been able to do everything else I've done with my business. It's given me every opportunity I have. The podcast, coffee, all of the yeah. appearances she does, every magazine cover she's on. So the thought is, if I stop posting videos, that's going to hurt my business every part of my business, right? We're not saying here that being a YouTuber is the hardest career, right? There are unbelievably difficult careers, but there is something that is very unique mm -hmm. to being a YouTube creator, and that's the paradox of permission. The idea here is that as a creator, no one has to give you permission to upload, and that's an unbelievable thing, right? That's the difference between television and being a creator. Television, there's a certain amount of slots that you can even upload, and there are gatekeepers that tell you when you can actually produce work. There's so many gatekeepers to traditional entertainment, which is why YouTube is so awesome. It's permissionless. Like you literally are like, I have an idea, I upload it. But the difficult thing is that with YouTube and with being a creator, no one gives you permission to take a break. If you take a month off, your career is over. That was the narrative in the YouTube community. You have to upload once a week minimum or else you will become irrelevant quicker than you can say the ABC is, baby. You will be done. You can't take a week off. That is the worst thing you could possibly do for your channel and career. You have to be consistent or else you will fail. I don't think as a community, we've all realized that yet. Like, I think it's even something that we're starting to realize that there's no one here to say, hey, it's cool if you take a two week break. That's all right. You know, and like you, when you're in the cycle, you're like, that's not okay. How, why would I do that? This paradox of permission is the reason the cycle exists. This is what creates the endless nature of a YouTube upload schedule. Now, I do think there's a solution for this. And I do think as a community creators, we are starting to recognize this in conversations like this, like what Emma did on her podcast are bringing up this problem. And we have to find a solution if we want a long-term career. One of the things Emma mentioned on her podcast is that, you know, now that she's not posting as many YouTube videos, she's going to be spending the time working on her podcast or even more specifically, she talks about Chamberlain Coffee. So we're going to get into the solution for how Emma can come back to YouTube in a healthy way. But creator-led brands like Chamberlain Coffee, they are part of that solution. And a lot of creator-led brands are powered 
by Shopify. Wow, Colin, what a segue. Shop- Normally, I'm not the segue guy. You're not guy. the segue I'm guy, not the segue guy. But there you go. Shopify is the sponsor of today's episode. Shopify is an all-in-one commerce platform that's used by tons of creators. Chamberlain Coffee runs on Shopify. Retinlink's Mythical Store runs on Shopify. And Simply Nail Logical runs her Hollow Taco brand on Shopify. And we use Shopify ourselves for our published merch. You don't need millions of subscribers to launch a merch store. Starting early can actually help your channel because it gives you content opportunities. Like for us, when we first started this channel, we actually built and sold skateboards and we made a three-part series about that process. And that series really helped build our audience and develop a deep connection with them because they got to see the behind the scenes process of launching a brand. So if you've been having a merch idea or just want to explore the opportunity to create a store, then head to shopify.com slash Colin and Samir for a free trial. Check out Shopify. Colin, what would you launch today right now? Brand new idea. I'd probably sell indoor plants. Oh, that's fun. Because like ours are really dying. And I think we need, we need better plants. A plant store. Yeah. I love it. Thanks. The way that we think Emma can come back to YouTube in a healthy way is by making her uploads seasonal. Making your content seasonal means you're essentially creating a a defined amount of episodes and then releasing them. So let's just look at some of our favorite TV shows. Typically they release in like 10 episode seasons, right? So Euphoria just finished. That was 10 episodes. I haven't watched. You haven't watched? Yeah, it it just gives me anxiety. Yeah, but that's the whole, that's the fun of it. I watch shows late at night and I, I don't need that. I'll stick with Love Island. Thank you very much. Anyway, any TV show, whether it's Love Island or Euphoria, that happens in a season. There's a set amount of episodes. It's promoted when they're going to launch. And then when it's gone, it's gone. And those episodes are produced and they're high quality and they come out, whether it's weekly or they come out all at once. But our suggestion for how YouTube can move and how creators like Emma can move is actually just defining seasons. And for her, quality was really important. If I want to be consistent on YouTube, that would mean that I'm going to have to post videos that, in my opinion, are lesser quality so that I can continue to upload them on a consistent basis. And that is just something I I don't want to do. But when you go seasonal, Mm -hmm. you can ensure that you're proud of what you're making. And from my perspective, I would rather watch something that she's proud of than something that she's not proud of just because she feels like she has to get something out. We think she should make a four-part series about Chamberlain Coffee, taking Mm -hmm. us from the origins, behind the scenes, all the way to what's next. And if she does that, she could work on it to a point where she really likes the quality Mm -hmm. of it. It would build her coffee business. And she's not the main topic of the episodes. Right. Right. And that's a huge part of it. That's a big part. If the episode gets an eight out of 10 in the YouTube studio, it's not necessarily like, Emma, we don't like you and your life. It's just the story that was told or whatever. It doesn't yeah. even matter. It's, and it's just like, it takes a little bit of the weight off of her. And I think it doesn't have to be limited to just the coffee series. She can also do short seasonal drops of episodes that are maybe like a cooking show with Emma, right? Where it's like three episodes of a cooking show. Maybe it's um, two episode piece on the Met Gala. Is there a four episode batch of content about Emma in Paris? And I think, again, this could happen four times through the year where she can do every quarter, there's like four episodes. I think this is actually just going to be a trend on YouTube as a whole because it is a healthier way to approach YouTube. What about the problem though, that if we go seasonal, we have less uploads, less opportunities to do integrations, we'll make less money. I think, yeah, yeah. And for Emma, that's less opportunities to talk about Chamberlain Coffee Mm -hmm. or to do a brand integration. As she's decreased her output on YouTube, she's increasing her output on podcast. She still can tell me about Chamberlain Coffee. She still can tell me about what she's doing and have advertisers integrated into it. I'm just getting less of the premier YouTube content. I think there's two realities here. I think there's one world where she has less uploads and because she's such a premium creator, her ad rates actually go up. Yeah. That's specific to her. But in another instance, maybe she just makes less money. Yeah. She Frank Oceans it. She Frank Oceans it. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Let's talk about it. Yeah. So in the new Aziz Ansari special, he talks about a conversation he had with Frank Ocean because every, every artist looks at Frank Ocean and they're like, how do you do it, man? You never do any press. You barely tour and you only put out your music when you really want to. And that's the, that's actually the concept of seasonality, right? Like make something you're really proud of, drop it, make it this big event and then bail for a little bit. What's the secret? And he said, oh man. He's got to be comfortable making less money, that's all. 
And I was like, oh shit. Make less money, you say. And in that instance, it's better to make less money and live a lifestyle that you actually enjoy. Right. Or a lifestyle that you can even just manage. Yeah, it's sustainable. Exactly. This like concept of premiering content, I think that's like that's probably what's going to start happening is people are marketing the release of their episodes, even if it's on an inconsistent basis or on a seasonal basis, they'll just start marketing it. When Hot Ones comes back, there's a trailer. And I think creators are doing this in different ways, right? Like Mark Rober uploads once a month. Like yeah. he uploads 12 videos a year, once a month. But they're like really big premiere events. And he's built and established that. Um, audience around that concept, but it works. And I think that we're moving in a direction where YouTube will accept that. The question is, can you start like that? Or is the cycle just part of the nature of growing as a creator is that you just have to upload on a regular basis so that you do build that audience to the point that then you could become a seasonal creator. I'm not sure you can start with breaks. I think as a creative, you have to take breaks. And I think that's something that even we're working on becoming more comfortable with and giving ourselves the permission to say, we can take a break. After stepping back from YouTube, I'm in a better state mentally than I've been in the past four years. But the reason creators don't do this is because they feel like those breaks are gonna hurt their channel. And there may be some truth to that. We yeah. saw Luke Corns, he took mm -hmm. a year off, yeah. came back and he really struggled to find viewership and struggled to build back a business. I ended up committing what is known as the deadliest of all YouTuber sins. I went without posting a video for over a year and a half. And I am now broke. But we've also seen other creators, I mean, ourselves, we took a break during the holidays. Mm -hmm and it didn't seem to affect us. That was a four week break. And even Patty Galloway, who follows YouTube super closely, tweeted that the audience is the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Basically saying that if your video is good, the audience will find it, even if you've taken a month or two off. I agree with that. And, and the reason, one of the main reasons I agree with that is because two years ago, when we started experimenting with this podcast, we actually uploaded it to a second channel. We did an episode with Eric and that got 400,000 views on a channel with under 10,000 subs. I actually think it will find viewership. It might be harder and it might take longer, but it, it will. I do think there's something the platforms yes. could do to help creators take breaks. YouTube is going to go through a very interesting shift. You rarely see a YouTuber create weekly videos for longer than a few years before they just quit. Right now, as we mentioned, the platform, specifically YouTube, is very encouraging of continuing to upload. Like yes. it is, when we took a break, I had to take a break from looking at YouTube Studio because it's like, hey, what's going on guys? You're uploading less videos and uh, everything's gray. So how's your life now? Just <laughs> yeah. gray? It's gray like these arrows? Is your hair going gray? Yes, yours is. Well, okay. What are you, YouTube studio in the flesh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be YouTube studio for Halloween. <laughs> so we've spoken with some people about this before, but we think what the platforms should do is have a button in the back end where you can say, I'm on a break. And what that does is freeze in time the audience that you currently have. If mm -hmm. there are people, if all of you are watching right now and you like our channel, you like what you're watching, then we press break. We're on a break mm -hmm. for two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is. When we come back, it's as if nothing happened. Like the amount of people who are engaging with us, they get notified as if yeah. we had never left. And maybe there's like a public facing thing too, that it's like yeah, on break. Not? Like I think people would be so excited. They'd be, oh great, this person's on break, but they still have this library of content I can watch and I can subscribe to them because you know they're coming back at some point. Or if we could say like new episodes start X, and I guess we could put that on our channel banner, but I think the platforms should do that, like a button that says I'm on a break, even so that your analytics, like don't, don't show me how how much my viewership's decreasing, <laughs> yeah. how relatively to what I was doing when I was uploading once a week, that now that I took a two week break, everything is down in the dumps. Like, let me just come back to that. And of course you as a creator can choose to not look at YouTube studio, but it's, it's all we have. It's all we have. Yeah. Like it's, it's what we do. So I think that this button of I'm on a break would really support even the suggestion to creators to take a break. The button also helps creators set expectations for their audience. We see in Emma's comments, like they, they don't know where she went. She's not gonna make a full video to release on her channel about the fact that she's taking a break and doesn't know when she's coming back. Yeah. Because that's not a good video. All of this is about communication and expectations because as creators, when we don't communicate to our audience, we build up this narrative in our head that they're gonna leave, uh, but they're probably more understanding. We just 
sometimes can't figure out how to communicate. So if there is a button that then publicly says, I'm on a break, it becomes part of the culture that it's okay for a YouTuber to take a break. It's okay for a creator to take a couple weeks off. And I just, I, I can't reiterate it enough that it is completely okay. I mean, like, a normal the, job yeah. has breaks built in for a reason. Right. So being a YouTube creator or any type of creator, that should be baked into the platform because that's where yeah. we work. That take a break button could actually make us all better creators. creators. Yeah. And I also want to acknowledge that it's hard. Like for us, even it's hard to, to look out and be like, we're not going to upload that week. We're going to take a break. That's hard. It, for me, that's extremely hard. Not hard for me. I'm going to go to the beach and drink a margarita. You like Marks? <laughs> Actually, I don't. I hate Marks. <laughs> yeah. They're too sugary. So I think as a whole, we're going to start to see creators move in this seasonal format where they're going to drop episodes. They're going to make these premiere events and they're going to give themselves the opportunity to take breaks. At least that's where I hope this goes because I think that's the only way that being a creator becomes a long-term sustainable career. Make sure to subscribe to the channel so we can pass the NHL in subscribers because when Colin was a young kid playing hockey, he got cut from his team and never got the opportunity to make the NHL. So we want to show them who's boss by passing them in subscribers. All right. Thanks for watching. We'll see I didn't you next say week. It was okay to bring that up. Was that private information? Yeah. It's in one of our shorts.